1962, the world is pressing the floodgates of social change and political powers are on edge. One man, a shepherd of his people, seeks renewal. In an unpredicted decision by an ailing pope, John XXIII grabs the world's attention, calling a council that will burst open the windows of the church, speaking to all nations of the world. The four years of prayer, reflection, and debate by the world's bishops would come to be known as Vatican II. Already during the first session of the council, the bishops had turned their attention to the very foundation of Christian belief, the Holy Scriptures and the 2,000-year-old tradition of the Church. How do we go forth and say our understanding of sacred Scripture? Following in the footsteps of his predecessor, the late John XXIII, Pope Paul VI would carry forward with the council bishops this key discussion on Scripture. Join us as we meet with historians and theologians, eyewitnesses and experts to investigate the meaning of Vatican II and uncover the event which would become a definitive landmark in the history of the modern Catholic Church. Bishops and theologians gather from all corners of the world to the center of Catholicism, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The council is in its first of ultimately four autumns and has already made great strides for transformation. By November 1962, one discussion has at last been settled. A constitution on sacred liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, has already been provisionally approved by the council's estimated 2,300 attendees. Refashioning the shape of what has been the Church's most sacred form of worship for nearly 2,000 years, this reform of liturgy is nothing short of monumental. One of the most tangible results of the Council uh, were the changes in the liturgy. Um, prior to the Council, Mass was said in Latin, the priest had his back to the people, to the congregation during most of the Mass, except perhaps for the homily, the sermon. Um, Catholics began to see changes in the liturgy already in 1964 before the Council concluded. Um, ultimately, in 1970, we would receive a new Mass that was more participatory, that involved the congregation in giving responses to the prayers. Having formulated these principles for the renewal of liturgy, the bishops move on to the discussion of the role of Holy Scripture in the life of the Church. The Bible has always played a central role in Christian life, and renewal would be incomplete without the Council Fathers deepening the Church's understanding and use of these fundamental texts. The idea of God's revelation, that what we know about the faith, we know it because God has chosen to reveal to us Himself, His mystery, the mystery of His Son, the mystery of salvation, the mystery of our eternal destiny, the bishops began to discuss a draft document examining divine revelation, a document that would ultimately become the dogmatic constitution known as Dei Verbum, Word of God. Central to this discussion is the relationship between the scriptures themselves and the tradition of the church. There's so many different factors that lead into Vatican II, especially in terms of the theology of a document like Dei Verb. We're dealing with what's called Nouvelle Theologie, the idea of uh, a ressourcement, the return to the sources, patristic sources, scriptural sources, an emphasis on that, a new understanding of tradition uh, as well. One of the most debated questions at the Council revolved around the use of modern methods of interpreting ancient texts. Pope Pius XII had already noted the historical nature of these biblical texts and the need to interpret them in light of that history. Ultimately, we are beginning to address the issues of, um, of various scripture commentaries that had come out during the time. How do we read scripture itself? Do we take it in a literal sense? Do we read it in a spiritual sense? Do we read it uh, in what's called the historical critical method? And this document, Dei Verbum, 
really helps us as a church to reflect on the notion of uh, the reading of sacred scripture today. The bishops were now faced with the challenge of navigating the pillars of diverse theological traditions. The document draft caused profound debates among the Council Fathers, raising questions about its viability as it had been presented to them. A different dynamic happens early in the Council. One of the first documents that they deal with, it was titled just the generic Latin title, De Revelatione, On Divine Revelation, all right? And as the bishops debate the document, it becomes very clear that many of the bishops are deeply unhappy with the document for a number of reasons. Um, remember that uh, Pope Pius XII had issued an important document in 1943, Divino Aflante Spiritu, in which he opened the door for Catholic biblical scholars to make use of the best of modern Catholic biblical scholarship. Well, in some Catholic seminaries, that was eagerly, you know, pounced upon, and scholar, Catholic teachers were using modern biblical scholarship in new and exciting ways. But some bishops were opposed to such changes. In other sectors of the church, though, people were very resistant to that. And one of the complaints about this preparatory draft is it was written almost as if Divino Aflante Spiritu hadn't been promulgated. There was no evidence of the best of modern biblical scholarship being used. On one side of the debate was Alfredo Cardinal Ottaviani, who had been appointed by John XXIII as head of the Holy Office. This congregation was responsible for responding to theological controversies in the church. Ottaviani's position reflected an antiquated and more defensive tone as contained in the draft document. Now, we get some very lively uh, speeches about this, for and against it. Cardinal Ottaviani gets up and gives a very impassioned defense in which he says this draft represents the best of Catholic biblical scholarship. Sparks fly in the aula as the council members debate, a large number of them insisting upon a complete rewrite. At which point another cardinal, I think it was again Cardinal Leonard, gets up uh, later that day and gives an intervention. He says, well, what it represents is the best of scholarship at the Lateran, which is one of the colleges in Rome. But, and this was sort of alluding to the fact that the preparatory draft was prepared by some biblical scholars, but others, for example, those at the Jesuit Pontifical Biblical Institute in Rome, largely weren't consulted. It's absolutely fascinating to see how many revisions had to go into the making of De Verbum. People were going back and forth contesting various images. How do we go forth and say our understanding of sacred scripture? Remember, it's all coming from a whole other source. There was also a concern that it was a very anti-ecumenical draft. The, the title of the first chapter was on the two sources of divine revelation. All right, now, this is very anti-ecumenical because if you think about the Protestant Reformation, right, one of the slogans of Martin Luther and the Reformers is sola scriptura, scripture alone. Well, the title of this draft plays right into the, the complaints of the Reformers. It seems to suggest there are two sources. I sometimes call this the two-drawer filing cabinet theory of revelation. So drawer one, that's scripture, and we Catholics and Protestants, we have all the stuff in drawer one, but drawer two, that's tradition and only Catholics have drawer two, right? So there are two sources of revelation, scripture and then this other stuff, tradition, that's added to it. In the midst of debate, the well-respected Augustine Cardinal Bea, head of the Secretariat for Christian Unity, reminds the council members of Pope John XXIII's mission for Vatican II, highlighting the pontiff's moving opening address. Bea recalls for the bishops Pope John's hopes for both a pastoral and ecumenical tone to the Council's decisions. Ottaviani and his committee are hesitant to yield to the majority's position. Most bishops stand in favor of an understanding of scripture and tradition grounded in the thinking of the great bishops and theologians of the early church. Theologically, if we look at the theological shift that has been inaugurated by the Constitution on the Revelation, De Verbum, we see that the whole issue to be faithful to the tradition in a creative way, which means being faithful to the message and not to the language of the tradition, that is theologically the first step 
The debates continue for an entire week with seemingly no hope for change. This once optimistic council appears to be caught in a riptide of conflicting ideologies. The general secretary of the council, Archbishop Perico Felici, decides to intervene. So they go back and forth and back and forth, and finally, Archbishop Felici suggests they have a straw vote. We need to decide what we're going to do here. But, but the way they articulated the vote was very tricky. The straw vote was worded not as a vote on whether you like the draft or not. The vote was on whether to end debate on the draft. So if you liked the draft, all right, you voted no for ending debate. If you didn't like the draft, you voted yes to end debate. So if you like the document, vote no. If you don't like the document, vote yes. This approach generated even more confusion in the hall of the council. Frankly, I'm not sure a lot of the bishops completely understood what their vote meant. But to make matters worse, they insisted that the two-thirds majority rule applied. Well, the two-thirds majority rule was intended to be a rule for approving a document. They were requiring a two-thirds majority to get rid of the document. So anyway, they have the vote. A clear majority of the bishops say they want to end debate and get rid of the document. But they come about 80 votes short of the two-thirds that's required. So now the, they're stuck with the draft. They're going to have to continue debating, even though the bishops clearly think it's inadequate. It was time for Pope John to step in. Pope John had been watching the proceedings on closed-circuit television. And so the next morning, on his own authority, he decrees that the draft be removed. And he decrees the establishment of a new mixed commission that would have co-chairs. One would be the leading supporter of the draft, Cardinal Alfredo Ottaviani, the prefect for the Holy Office, and the other would be Cardinal Augustine Bea, a more progressive voice at the council, a noted biblical scholar, and the president for the Secretariat for Christian Unity. Now, with Cardinals Ottaviani and Bea taking position as co-presidents, the document would at last move forward, with these two bishops working in union to bring balance to the draft. Over the next two sessions of the Council, the Vatican II bishops would reach a consensus that would ultimately lead to the issuing of the dogmatic constitution Dei Verbum. The document would come to deliver six dynamic chapters, summarizing how scripture and revelation are essentially two sides of the same coin. De Verbum teaches that God reveals himself to mankind in words and deeds, narrated through sacred scripture. And at the center of the scripture is Christ, the eternal word of God made man. The gospel is always new. Remember that what the Christ gave us uh, is beautiful uh, announce that Christ is alive, that he loves us. Uh, it's still new, it's still uh, modern, and we, he we need to hear it. And I know that so many young, because I, I meet young people, uh, they are thirsty to, to, to hear this, to hear that that's true, that uh, uh, really loves, uh, really God loves them, and sometimes we are a little bit afraid to, to speak about this. And uh, it's, it's a pity if we are afraid because so many young people uh, are thirsty to hear this good news, really that that's true, that uh, God knows us, loves us. Divine revelation is to be discovered in the scriptures as transmitted and understood through the centuries-old tradition of the Church, as described in Dei Verbum. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture, then, are bound closely together and communicate with the other, for both of them, flowing out from the same divine wellspring, come together in some fashion to form one thing and move towards the same goal. The term, inspiration of scripture, does not mean that the biblical writers were mere tools, but rather authors, in the real sense, moved to proclaim the Word of God under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It's not a matter of uh, a person generating their own ideas, or uh, it's, it's the 
content of our faith comes from God through revelation. And that built on one of the important documents of the Second Vatican Council, the Constitution on Revelation, which highlighted this as the absolute cornerstone of the Christian faith. Since De Verbum attests that the sacred writers are affirmed by the Holy Spirit, it calls on the faithful to acknowledge that the books of Scripture firmly, faithfully, and without error teach that truth which God, for the sake of our salvation, wished to see confided to the sacred scriptures. Christians see the inherited scriptural tradition of the Hebrew people, that is, the Old Testament, as an essential part of discovering God's will. There's a very special relationship that the church has with the Jewish people uh, because their scripture is part of our biblical canon. They are internal to our self-understanding. That dialogue is an internal dialogue within the larger people of God framework. The New Testament reveals the new covenant founded through Christ and the unveiling of the mystery of God as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The story of Christ's life, death, and resurrection is brought to the people firsthand by the apostles and the inspired writing of the Gospels. These Gospels show the beginnings of the Church and its ability to grow through God's grace. Theologians Monsignor John Strinkowski, Father James Massa, and Dr. Rick Gallardi iron out the understanding of sacred scripture. It strikes me that in Vatican II, every time the, the Council makes a positive statement about the Church, it always follows by saying, but this is a Church that needs to be reformed. That, that every, every positive statement is qualified by the call to an ongoing renewal and reformation. Yeah, the, the image, the, the, the phrasing that often comes to my mind is that the council adopted a posture of confident humility. Mm -hmm. Confidence because in Christ we have all that we need, right? And Christ is the most precious gift that we do offer to the world. Humility because we never have Christ in our back pocket. You know, De Verbum 8 speaks of our moving towards the fullness of truth, which, which suggests that humility, that uh, there's always more to learn. There's always more change, more uh, uh, reform and renewal that we are need to be about individually and as a church. De Verbum encourages all members of the church to read the scriptures prayerfully and consistently in order to more fully enter into a living, authentic relationship with Christ. All those insights of the council uh, can then filter down to the average Catholic all over the United States and make a difference uh, in our parishes, in our personal Christian lives and witness, and make the church uh, more convinced, strong, and uh, active in presenting and witnessing to our Christian faith. The dogmatic constitution on divine revelation would finally be promulgated by Pope Paul VI on November 18, 1965. We live in a culture now that uh, is not always amenable or receptive to the faith, sometimes even hostile to Christian beliefs. So Catholics need to be, it's not enough to just go to Mass on Sunday and uh, that's it. Uh, Catholics need to be uninformed, converted, so that they see their faith as a way of life, not compartmentalized, and convinced, and able to share that with conviction uh, with others. With the intuition of Pope John XXIII, the vision and strength of his successor, Paul VI, and by prayerful work of the many leaders of the Church, we today see the enormous impact of De Verbum in the world. During that period, that late 1950s, that uh, it's no mistake that uh, Blessed John XXIII in 1959 uh, called for the Second Vatican Council to really see the Church not as a musty museum, but as a living, um, as a living um, body growing and uh, adapting and changing, evolving, I should say, rather than changing, always keeping clear to the tradition that is the church, always uh, keeping close to uh, 
uh, the, the sacred scripture as well. So I think that's really the key. It's looking at the time period, but um, responding to the time and not um, per se bending or, 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 or um, changing, but evolving to where the Lord really wants us to be at this moment. The intention of the Council Fathers in the context of De Verbum is best expressed in Scripture itself. All Scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for refutation, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that one who belongs to God may be competent, equipped for every good work. To understand how God calls everyone to holiness through union with Christ, and to find meaning in Him in the midst of the joys and sorrows of everyday life. Join us next time for Vatican II, Inside the Council.